I'm the coordinator for the Ocean Acidification Community of Practice. Uh, formed in 2018, the Mealpar Ocean Acidification Community of Practice is an interdisciplinary group dedicated to sharing information and resources related to ocean acidification in Canada. We strive to provide a space for discussion and co-production of ocean acidification knowledge across Canada. Our goals are to coordinate and connect across all sectors, disciplines, and regions to share expertise, data, and resources related to ocean acidification, identify pressing needs for ocean acidification research and knowledge in Canada, and create a collaborative and supportive environment for groups affected by ocean acidification. Our members consist of individuals from government, aquaculture, fisheries, academia, and indigenous community leadership, as well as students and members of the general public. Everyone is welcome to join our community and I'll post the link in the chat in just a moment. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Kristen Rutherford. Kristen is a PhD candidate at Dalhousie University. Uh, Kristen was born and raised in Southern Ontario, and she did her undergraduate degree in engineering chemistry at the Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. While there, she spent a couple of summers with the geography department doing research on high Arctic watersheds. Shortly after graduating from Queen's, she joined Dr. Katja Fennell's group at Dalhousie University in Halifax to do her master's degree in oceanography. And she enjoyed this work so much that after a couple of years working on her master's thesis, she decided to keep working with Dr. Fennell to complete her PhD. This work has focused on using a biogeochemical model of the Northwest North Atlantic to understand the carbon cycling and transport in the area. She will be defending her PhD in the next few months. Um, so today, Kristen will be sharing some of this work with us, and her talk is entitled Source or Sink, a numerical modeling for studying inorganic carbon fluxes on the Scotian shelf. So without further ado, take it away, Kristen. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking a bit about my PhD research, which I have done under the supervision of Dr. Katja Fennell as well as with the help of many collaborators, a few of whom are listed on the slide here. And so my work has looked at understanding the inorganic carbon cycling and transport on the Scotian shelf with the use of a biogeochemical model of the Northwest North Atlantic. And uh, yeah, so we'll just get a bit started into more general introduction. I want to start by talking about, in general, global continental shelves and why it's important to understand inorganic carbon cycling and the air sea CO2 fluxes here. So in general, continental shelves are thought to disproportionately contribute to global air sea CO2 fluxes compared to the open ocean. And they uh, experience uh, climate change on much shorter timescales compared to the open ocean. Furthermore, they have high rates of both temporal and spatial variability, making it incredibly important to understand these fluxes here. With that in mind, many studies have looked at classifying global continental shelves in terms of their air, sea, CO2 fluxes. And one such study is shown here on the left-hand side by Ruberi Al in 2019. So this figure I adapted from the study by Ruberi Al where latitude is on the y-axis and air sea CO2 fluxes are on the x-axis. Negative values indicate uh, fluxes that are going into the ocean and positive fluxes indicate sources that indicate uh, fluxes that are going out into the atmosphere. And so I've indicated a gray dash line here just to help visualize uh, sinks are to the left and sources are to the right. And so what you can see from this figure is that there's a relatively clear latitudinal trend in air sea CO2 fluxes on continental shelves. So at low latitudes, continental shelves tend toward net outgassing of CO2 to the atmosphere. And at mid and high latitudes, continental shelves tend towards net ingassing of CO2 from the atmosphere to the ocean. And so what about the Scotian shelf? So I now have indicated a red star on the y-axis, which is the approximate latitudinal location of the Scotian shelf. And so what you can see is that this is a mid-latitude shelf, and from the latitudinal trend, you would expect it to be acting as a net sink of CO2. 
Many studies have looked at classifying the Scotian Shelf's air CO2 flux, and I'm going to walk through a few of these studies now, summarizing it in a bar plot. And again, I'll reiterate positive values indicate fluxes that are going into the atmosphere out of the ocean, and negative values indicate the shelf is acting as a sink, taking up CO2 from the atmosphere. So the first study uh, here is by Shadwick et al. in 2011. This is a regional study on the Scotian Shelf using a moored karaoke buoy where they found that the Scotian Shelf was acting as a large net source of CO2 to the atmosphere. Then Signorini in 2013 in another regional study found contrasting results that the Scotian Shelf was acting as a net sink of CO2. In a global study by Laura Wallet et al. in 2014, they found that the Scotian Shelf was again acting as a net sink of CO2. And then in 2015, in a regional study, Laura Wallet et al. found that again, the Scotian Shelf was acting as a net sink of CO2. And so with all of these conflicting uh, estimates of air sea CO2 flux on the Scotian Shelf, one of the big overarching questions of my research has been, is the Scotian Shelf acting as a net source or a net sink of CO2? And for the purposes of this talk, I want to divide my research into two sub questions. First, how are biological processes affecting shelf wide PCO2? And secondly, what are the dominant transport processes on the Scotian shelf? And so we'll answer these two questions first before tackling the big overarching question of whether the Scotian shelf is a source or sink. And so before diving into my more specific results, I wanted to first establish some general processes that could be occurring on continental shelves and impacting the air sea CO2 fluxes. So biologically, uh, we have primary production, which converts inorganic carbon into organic matter. And then we have the opposite process of respiration, which would return inorganic carbon, um, return to inorganic carbon. We can also have sinking out of that organic matter as particulates, which can settle into the sediment, and some of that can return to the water column. And then at the atmosphere ocean interface, we have air sea gas exchange. So if there is oversaturation of carbon in the surface waters on the continental shelf, we would see outgassing to the atmosphere, and vice versa. If there is an undersaturation of carbon on, in the surf waters, we would see an influx of carbon from the atmosphere to the ocean. In terms of transport processes on the Scotian Shelf in particular, um, there are two dominant along shelf currents that occur on the Scotian Shelf. There is the inner branch, the Nova Scotia current, and the outer branch, the Shelf Break current. We can additionally have um, riverine input, which would supply inorganic carbon and organic matter. And then there are a couple general processes that tend to be studied in relation to air sea CO2 fluxes. And one of these processes is upwelling. Uh, so upwelling is often studied where uh, subsurface DIC rich water is brought to the surface waters on the continental shelf, leading to an oversaturation of carbon, which would lead to outgassing to the atmosphere. And this is well studied in relation to the Oregon, California coast, where upwelling events are well documented, documented and leading to outgassing. And then a second general process that can occur on continental shelves is offshore transport, also known as the continental shelf pump. And now this continental shelf pump tends to occur at mid and high latitudes because it relies on wintertime cooling to create cold, dense water on the continental shelf that is rich in inorganic carbon and then subsequently transported to the subsurface open ocean, taking with it that DIC rich water. So this leads to an undersaturation of carbon on the continental shelf, which leads to an influx of carbon from the atmosphere to the ocean. The continental shelf pump was first coined by Sinagai in 1999 and was found to occur in the East China Sea. And so now that we've established a few kind of general processes that can occur on continental shelves, I want to first dive into the biological processes and how they are impacting the CO2 on the Scotian shelf. And so as I mentioned, my work has been done with the use of a biogeochemical ROMS model of the Northwest North Atlantic. A few details of the model are shown on the right hand side here. 
and on the left hand side is the model domain. And so you can see from our model domain that we include everything from the Gulf of Maine up past Newfoundland. So we have the East Newfoundland shelf here, Grand Banks, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Scotian shelf, and the Gulf of Maine. We have Nova Scotia right here, and where I am, Halifax is right here. And so in this region, there are a couple of very important um, circulation features that I want to mention, mainly that the uh, Scotian shelf is located at the junction of the subpolar and subtropical gyres. So we have the Gulf Stream here in white, uh, which carries warm and salty water northward. And then we have the Labrador Current carrying uh, subpolar water southward out and around Grand Banks and along the uh, shelf of Nova Scotia, uh, Scotian shelf, sorry. We also have an inner branch of this transport moving southwestward. And so of course this work could not have been done just with the model. We've also had access to some very amazing uh, observational data sets which have helped us uh, do this analysis. And so I wanna introduce those now. First, we have uh, had a moored Karaoke buoy located at this red diamond here. And this buoy was implemented from 2007 to 2014, giving us this really uh, amazing time series of surface PCO2 observations with high temporal uh, resolution. The second data set I want to introduce is the Atlantic Condor Ship Track. Uh, the Cirque Ocean Lab Group has implemented a PCO2 sensor on the commercial Atlantic Condor ship, which makes regular trips from the Halifax Harbor, which is indicated by the teal box here, out to the Sable Island oil platform, the pink box. And so this gives us uh, quite high spatial and temporal resolution of surface PCO2 as the ship goes out every couple of weeks. And so this black line indicates the average ship track of the Atlantic Condor. So now we can dive into some of the results. And I want to first focus in on the seasonal cycle of PCO2 on the Scotian shelf. So shown now on the left hand side is a compilation of seasonal cycle from the model compared to the observations. So on the x axis is time and on the y axis is surface PCO2. The teal bluish colors are the observations from the Carioca buoy, again indicated by the red diamond on the map on the right hand side. The pink points indicate the observations from the Atlantic condor transect at approximately the buoy location. The gray points indicate the observations from the SOCAT version 2020 database averaged over the Scotian shelf and for each month. And the thick black line indicates the model mean seasonal cycle of surface PCO2. And what I want to first point out is a really interesting feature in the seasonal cycle from the Carioca buoy observations. So starting in March and going into April, we see this quite large and rapid drawdown in surface PCO2. We have a drawdown of about, or decline of about 200 microatmospheres over about 30 days. And this aligns with the spring bloom increase in chlorophyll occurring on the Scotian shelf. So I've now um, inserted a panel above the surface PCO2 indicating chlorophyll at the buoy location. The green points indicate glider observations. The dark green points indicate AZMP cruise bottle data. And the black line, again, indicates the model average. And what you can see is that at the initiation of the spring bloom is when we start to see this decline in PCO2. And so this relates to an increase in chlorophyll taking up DIC, which then leads to a decrease in PCO2. And I'll also note that the spring bloom occurs when temperature is at a minimum and relatively constant. Following the spring bloom, we see an increase in PCO2, which is associated with the thermal control of increasing temperature. And so what we see is that after the spring bloom, which dominates the seasonal cycle in April, in March and April, the temperature and thermal control starts to dominate the seasonal cycle, where we see an increase in PCO2 associated with warming, reaches a maximum in August and September, and then we see cooling set in, which decreases PCO2. And so if we look 
now at the Atlantic Condor observations in comparison to the model, we can get a clear picture of what's happening across the entire shelf. So now shown here in the top panel is longitude on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. The color indicates PCO2, the background color indicates the model PCO2, and the points on top indicate the PCO2 from the Atlantic Condor vessel. And this is the transect um, along the black line here. And so what you can see, first of all, is that there's relatively uniform PCO2 across the shelf in both the observations and in the model. Um, what you also see is a similar seasonal type cycle to what we observed in the Carioca buoy observations, where we see a decline in PCO2 starting in March and into April, and then we see a subsequent increase in PCO2 as warming sets in, reading, reaching a maximum in August and September. The seasonal cycle is reflected in the bottom panel here, where we now have PCO2 on the y-axis. And this bottom panel is the average PCO2 across the transect, comparing the model to the observations. The model, again, is the black line, and the pink points are the observations. And again, you can see a very similar seasonal cycle. So now that we've talked a bit about the biological processes and how they are dominating the cycle, the seasonal cycle of PCO2 in March and April, um, we now want to talk a bit about the transport processes and how they are affecting the PCO2 on the Scotian shelf. And so to start with, I wanted to continue focusing in on the Atlantic condor uh, transect. And so I'm about to start an animation, but I just want to orient, orient everyone with what I'm about to show. So on the y-axis is PCO2. On the x-axis is longitude along the transect. On the left-hand side of each of the panels is towards Halifax Harbor, and to the right-hand side is towards the shelf breaks of the transect. The left panel is the model, and the right panel are the observations. And as I start the animation, we'll start to see transects appear, and the color is in, indicates the day of the year. So we'll start to see transects in this grayish color. As the bloom sets in, we start to see the transects move towards this orange color. As warming starts to occur, the transects transition to this purple color. And then as cooling starts, the transects transition to a blue and then gray color. So here we see PCO2 start to decline during the spring bloom. We see PCO2 increasing as warming occurs, reaching a maximum. And then as cooling starts to occur, PCO2 declines again. And we see a similar cycle in both the model and observations. And we also see that PCO2 is relatively uniform uh, across the entire transect in both the model and the observations. And so this is just a slightly different way of looking at the transect. Um, what I want to point out um, are a few instances when PCO2 is not uniform across the transect and we're actually seeing some spatial variability. And so in both the model and the observations, we see a few transects during the summer months where PCO2 declines towards the Halifax Harbor. So we see an example here and examples here. And so to tease apart what could be driving this spatial variability, we can focus in on the model during some of these events. So shown here is a snapshot of modeled surface PCO2 from July 11th, one of the transects where we're seeing this low PCO2 near shore. And you can see quite clearly this thin bland band of low PCO2 along the coastline of Nova Scotia and relatively uniform PCO2 across the rest of the shelf. We can then look at temperature and DIC along this transect to further tease apart what could be occurring. So on the y-axis now on these two new panels are depth and longitude is on the x-axis. Temperature is the top panel here and DIC is the bottom panel. And on top of both of these are density contours. And what you can see is that with the density contours, they're moving upwards towards the coastline of Nova Scotia which would indicate coastal upwelling occurring here. And so this upwelling is bringing with it cold water that is slightly DIC elevated. 
And so if you remember from the beginning of my talk, I did mention upwelling and its effects on surface PCO2. In general, we tend to think that upwelling brings DIC rich waters to the surface, which drive outgassing. And so coastal upwelling is quite well documented, well documented on the Scotian shelf, and many studies have found it to be occurring throughout the summer months. Um, but none have really looked at uh, how it relates to the air sea gas exchange. And so instead of this um, rich DIC water being brought to the surface and increasing surface PCO2, we're actually seeing that there are two competing effects on surface PCO2 on the Scotian shelf. This upwelled water is quite cold, which wants to lower PCO2. And this is competing with our typical understanding of upwelling, um, where this DIC elevated water is going to increase PCO2. However, on the Scotian shelf, what we see is that the range in temperatures compared from the inner um, band of water, upwelled water, compared to the rest of the shelf, the range in temperatures is larger and dominates the PCO2 signal. So really we're seeing that the thermodynamic influence of this cold upwelled water is outweighing the slightly elevated DIC in that near shore band. This is a really interesting finding and contrasts how we think upwelling affects uh, PCO2 and air CCO2 fluxes. So that we've talked about some smaller scale features on the Scotian shelf. I wanna talk a bit more about these bigger mechanisms that we have thought um, that we often study in relation to fluxes and whether anything's occurring across the shelf break on the Scotian shelf. And to do that, I would want to, we have implemented passive dye tracers in our model. And so on the uh, right hand side here is again our model domain, but now divided into different subregions. And in each of these different subregions, we have initialized a passive dye tracer that is allowed to advect and diffuse throughout the model domain so that we can see how these different waters are moving throughout the region. And I'll note that in this slope region here, we've divided the region into two different depth levels, a depth above 500 meters and depth below 500 meters. For the purposes of the next few slides, I'm just gonna be focusing in on the dye initialized in this Labrador Sea region here, the light blue, the dye initialized in the Scotian shelf region here, and the dye initialized below 500 meters in the slope region. So starting with our Labrador C, this blue dye here, we see how this dye moves around Grand Banks, follows the bathymetry along the Scotian shelf here. Uh, and we also see that there's a lot of exchange between the Labrador C and the East Newfoundland shelf with a lot of this water moving onto the continental shelf with that inner branch I mentioned earlier moving southwestward as well. On the Scotian shelf, we see the water moving quickly to the south with only a small amount of water remaining mid shelf. Again, that dominant southwestward transport here. And then in the deep slope region, this purple dye, we see that the dye mainly remains off shelf and does not move very easily onto the Scotian shelf or onto any of the continental shelves. And the main movement onto the shelves is through the Northeast Channel here into the Gulf of Maine and into the Laurentian Channel here. To further reiterate the uh, dye tracer movement, I want to show a few transects along the Halifax line here, indicated on the map on the right hand side. And so what we see with the Labrador Sea dye is that it's creating almost this wall of water along the shelf break of the Scotian shelf and is inhibiting the movement of the Scotian shelf water across the shelf break and is also inhibiting the movement of that deep slope water across the shelf break onto the shelf. And so if we go back to these two big mechanisms that are often studied in relation to fluxes, and we look at the general movement of the dyes and water in the region, what we see is that this um, subpolar water that moves southwestward along the Scotian shelf and along the shelf break is acting almost as a barrier inhibiting the movement across the shelf break. And so neither upwelling or the continental shelf pump, upwelling across the shelf break, I should say, or the continental shelf pump are occurring here. <clears throat> 
And so just to summarize what we've talked about so far, in the first part of my talk, um, we looked at the seasonal cycle of PCO2, and we found that the spring bloom is a dominant feature in the seasonal cycle of PCO2 here. And then following the bloom, temperature controls the seasonality of PCO2. In terms of transport processes, we found that PCO2 is relatively uniform across the shelf, except for during coastal upwelling events throughout the summer months. Neither the continental shelf pump nor upwelling at the shelf break are occurring here. And a long shelf transport of subpolar North Atlantic water is the dominant transport process here. And so this leads to that big overarching question that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, is the Scotian shelf acting as a net source or net sink of CO2? And so to answer this question, I bring, have brought back this uh, bar plot from the beginning of my talk, where again, uh, positive flux values indicate the shelf acting as a net source of CO2, and negative flux values indicate shelf acting as a net sink. And we've now included this pink bar, which is the flux estimated from our model. And you can see we've estimated the model to act as a large net source of CO2, sorry, um, similar to the estimate from Shadwick et al. in 2011. And so if we bring back this figure from Ruberi et al. in 2019, we've now added in a point for the Scotian shelf flux. And we can see quite clearly that the Scotian shelf is deviating from the global latitudinal trend in air sea CO2 fluxes. And this has led to a kind of secondary question of my research. Why does the Scotian shelf deviate from this global air sea CO2 flux trend? And to start to tackle this question, I want to bring back the passive dye tracers and the R the overarching circulation in the region, which is that there is a dominant along shelf transport and delivery of subpolar North Atlantic waters to the Scotian shelf. And so this has led to a hypothesis that I want to evaluate over the next few slides and the rest of my talk. So this hypothesis is that cold and DIC rich subpolar North Atlantic water is traveling to the Scotian shelf where it is warmed and becomes oversaturated with CO2 leading to net outgassing of CO2 to the atmosphere. And so to test this hypothesis, we are going to stay focused in on the dye tracers that I just introduced, as well as the subregions in our model that I just introduced. And so there are two different types of subregions that we're going to be talking about. The first are the end members in the region, uh, or the dominant end members in the region, which are divided into three different parts. So we have our subpolar North Atlantic water end member, which is the East Newfoundland shelf here in orange and the open ocean lower sea here in blue. We then have the warm and salty slope water end member here in purple, and we have the St. Lawrence River end member here. And then we also have the continental shelves in the region and the different subregions associated with those. So we have the Grand Banks, Scotian Shelf, and Gulf of Maine. And so we will be analyzing how the different end members combine in each of these different continental shelves going from north to south. In other words, how the water tends to be traveling in the region. Again, noting that there's an inner branch of transport of this subpolar water going from East Newfoundland shelf to Grand Banks to Scotian shelf and then to the Gulf of Maine. And so to start um, to tackle this hypothesis, we're going to look at mass fractions of the passive tracer and members in each of our continental shelves. So starting in Grand Banks, here's a bar plot summarizing the mass fractions. And we see that on Grand Banks, the subpolar North Atlantic water is making up 86% of the water here, which makes sense. The Grand Banks is directly adjacent to both East Newfoundland shelf and Labrador Sea. Moving to the Scotian shelf, we find a similarly high percentage of subpolar North Atlantic water here at 73%. Um, but we do see a slightly higher influence of this warm and salty slope water, and of course, some influence from the St. Lawrence River. However, this does show that the subpolar North Atlantic water is a dominant end member on the Scotian shelf, making up three quarters of the water here. Then moving southward to the Gulf of Maine, 
we see that there is less influence of that North Atlantic water at only 59% and a higher influence of that warm and salty slope water, which makes sense if you remember from the dye tracer animation, we saw movement of that slope water through the Northeast Channel into the Gulf of Maine. To further tease apart how mixing of these end members is affecting the biogeochemistry on the Scotian shelf, I now want to walk through some results on a temperature DIC plot. And so this is very similar to a temperature salinity plot that um, many people are very used to. However, we now have DIC on the x-axis here. And so I'll note that there's a break in the x-axis so that we can have our St. Lawrence River end member on the same figure as the ocean end members. And so what we have on this figure are points of average temperature and DIC for each of our end members as well as our continental shelves. And these, uh, the temperature and DIC is averaged throughout the region, throughout the subregion, throughout the water column, and throughout time. So these are just kind of general temperature and DIC for the regions. And if we add in dash line, we now have a mixing polygon that combines all of our end members. And you see very nicely that our continental shelves fall within this mixing polygon. We then add in these triangles here, which are the average temperature and DIC from the GLODAP observational database. And these are just a check on our model to make sure it's doing relatively well. And you can see that it does a pretty good job at capturing the DIC and temperature for most of these subregions. And then the last point I want to bring in are these open circles here for the Gulf of Maine, Scotian Shelf, and Grand Banks. And these values are the predicted values of temperature and DIC for each of these continental shelves. And these predicted values are essentially values of temperature and DIC if only mixing were occurring. And how we calculate these predicted values is with a weighted mean. And this weighted mean is the sum of the product of the mass fraction for each of our end members multiplied by the average DIC or temperature in that end member. And so what this tells us, um, it hints towards what processes could be affecting the water as it's traveling to the Scotian shelf. And so what you'll note here is that the actual water on the Scotian shelf in the model compared to our predicted value is warmer and lower in DIC compared to the predicted value. And this indicates that in addition to mixing, we're also seeing warming to the water as it's traveling to the Scotian shelf and also a loss of DIC, either as a result of biological activity or outgassing to the atmosphere. And so to further tease this apart, I want to look at a few depth profiles of along the transport path of water to the Scotian shelf. And so I'm going to show a few different depth profiles, one of DIC and temperature. And I'm going to start with just showing the ocean end members, and then we're going to slowly add in the continental shelves to see how the DIC and temperature is changing. So shown here, we have the slope water and the Labrador Sea water. You can see Labrador Sea, this subpolar water is quite high in DIC. And then we have the East Newfoundland shelf water here in orange, again, um, high, high in DIC compared to, uh, similar to the Labrador Sea DIC content. Then we add in uh, the Grand Banks here in yellow, moving southward. We see that has a similar depth profile of DIC to East Newfoundland shelf. And then moving to the Scotian shelf, we see that the DIC content in the subsurface is very similar to East Newfoundland shelf and Grand Banks. However, we're seeing lower DIC in the surface waters here. And then moving to the Gulf of Maine, we see it has similar DIC to the Scotian shelf in the top 30 meters, and then it has lower DIC uh, the subsurface. Moving to look at temperature, um, again, starting with our ocean end members, we have the warm water in the slope region, and then the cold water in the Labrador Sea and on the East Newfoundland shelf. Adding in the profile for the Grand Banks, we see that it retains the cold water at depth, but is warmer in the surface waters compared to East Newfoundland shelf. And 
Then we add in the Scotian Shelf, and we see that throughout the water column, it is warmer compared to East Newfoundland Shelf. And then adding in the Gulf of Maine, again, even warmer waters seen in the Gulf of Maine. And so I want to take a moment to point out that on the Scotian Shelf, we're seeing that high DIC content still in the subsurface, but warmer waters. So this indicates that the water traveling to the Scotian Shelf, um, particularly in the subsurface, is retaining that um, high DIC from the subpolar water, but it is warming as it travels to the Scotian Shelf. And so to bring this all together, I want to bring in um, what I like to call the DIC disequilibrium, or in other words, it is the difference between the modeled DIC and a value that we've calculated as the equilibrium DIC. So assuming that the entire water column is in equilibrium with the atmosphere. And this is similar with uh, a similar value to AOU and just is a metric to understand over or under saturation of carbon using a conservative property. And so this is shown here on the right hand side where we can see that both the Labrador Sea and slope water is undersaturated with respect to carbon as well as East Newfoundland Shelf, our most northern continental shelf. Moving southward to Grand Banks, we see that throughout the water column, the water is becoming less undersaturated with respect to carbon. And then moving to the Scotian Shelf, we see that the water has now become oversaturated with respect to carbon. And then moving to the Gulf of Maine, we see that it's now close to equilibrium throughout the water column. To further understand this carbon disequilibrium and over and under saturation, uh, we're now going to look at the that's DIC minus DIC equilibrium um, as a seasonal cycle. And so we're going to go from the most northern continental shelf, the East Newfoundland shelf, down to the most southern continental shelf, Gulf of Maine, where blue colors indicate undersaturation and the greenish colors indicate oversaturation. And so what we see on the East Newfoundland shelf is that throughout the year and throughout the water column, uh, the water here is undersaturated with respect to carbon. And we do see a small time of year and the surface water is where the water is closer to equilibrium. On Grand Banks, we see a very similar picture where throughout the water column and throughout the year, uh, most of the water is undersaturated with respect to carbon. However, we see a similar um, oversaturation occurring in the surface waters in the summer months here. And so on both East Newfoundland Shelf and Grand Banks, this oversaturation is related to surface warming occurring at this time of the year. Then moving to the Scotian Shelf, we see a totally different picture. We're now throughout the water column and throughout the year, um, the water is oversaturated with respect to carbon. The only time that we see uh, undersaturation occurring is during that the spring bloom occurs in March and April. So that's when we see that very large and rapid decline in PCO2. And then moving to the Gulf of Maine, we see something that's similar to the Scotian Shelf. However, we see that the magnitude of over and under saturation is um, closer to equilibrium rather than um, these really dark green values that we see on the Scotian Shelf. And so if we bring this all together, what we're seeing is that as the water is moving southward, we're seeing that this high DIC is getting warmed and causing oversaturation of carbon. And this translates into the flux estimates for the region. So we've now brought back this figure from Ruberry Al in 2019. I've now added in flux estimates from the model for Grand Banks and the Gulf of Maine. And so what we see is that on Grand Banks, where we're seeing um, over undersaturation throughout most of the year, we see that it's behaving similar to the global trend and that it is acting as a net sink of CO2. Then moving to the Scotian Shelf, where we see um, large amounts of oversaturation occurring, we're seeing that it's acting as a large net source of CO2 to the atmosphere. And then moving southward to the Gulf of Maine, where we find that it is closer to equilibrium throughout most of the year, we also see that its flux estimate is um, essentially neutral. And so just to summarize everything that I've mentioned today, I know it's a bit of a dense talk. Um, what we've shown is that the Scotian Shelf PCO2 seasonality 
depends on a strong um, spring bloom, and secondly, a thermal control throughout the rest of the year. Shelf-wide PCO2 is spatially uniform, except for summer upwelling events that decrease PCO2 nearshore, contrary to a previous understanding of upwelling events. Overall, we report that the Scotian shelf acts as a net source of CO2, which deviates from the global trend of air sea CO2 fluxes. And we found that it's deviating from this trend and acting as a net source because it's heavily influenced by the subpolar North Atlantic waters that are GIC rich and are subsequently warmed as they travel southward. And so the next steps of my thesis, the last chapter I'm currently working on, are doing regional future projections to understand how um, the projected change in circulation here could be affecting the biogeochemistry and carbon on the Scotian shelf. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you, um, especially to my co-authors. And if you have any questions or comments, if you have to think of anything later, you can send me an email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. That was an excellent talk, a really informative and really unique perspective. Um, so I'll just let everyone have a chance. We'll have, we still have about uh, 10 or so minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions for Kristen related to her talk, um, please feel free to type them into the chat uh, box. And I see that we have one question already, Kristen, for you. Um, so this question asks, with respect to cold water temperature resulting in low PCO2 in freshly upwelled water, what is the alkalinity of that water? Could it be that the source water PCO2 is just not that high if it has a TA-TCO2 ratio that supports a lower initial PCO2? And presumably nutrients are supplied with the upwelled water. Could rapid nutrient drawdown at the site of upwelling also play a role? And this water, and as this water warms and PCO2 increases as it moves offshore. So several questions in there. Yes. Um, so let me think about that one for a sec. Um, so I'm not, I don't know if I know offhand the alkalinity of the upwelled water. Um, it could be interesting to plot that as well and see how that's changing with the upwelled water. Um, the temperature range is quite large. We've done a bit of a test to see if like how lowering that range could affect the PCO2. Um, and we found that at that DIC kind of range, if we were to lower or to decrease the range in temperatures to about four degrees Celsius rather than I think it's about seven or eight degrees, um, then DIC would be the more dominant control in the region. In general, we find DIC and temperature tend to be tend to dominate PCO2 here rather than alkalinity and salinity. Um, yes. And then in terms of the rapid nutrient drawdown at the site of upwelling, it's definitely, it could, there could be some like high biological activity happening that is keeping the DIC lower as it's upwelled, that's definitely possible. The upwelling events are quite short, so it would have to be very rapid nutrient drawdown. So I'm not sure. Um, I have to think about maybe how to test that and see if that could be happening. Awesome, excellent. So again, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat um, or yeah. Um, uh, I guess one other question, if no one else has a question, I have a question. I'm not a modeler, but um, I'm curious, uh, your results related to um, upwelling, um, do you think that these are unique to the Scotian shelf, or do you think that this has possible wider implications for other areas with upwelling? Um, I definitely think it's it's possible it could be happening elsewhere. I know the Scotian shelf, we really do have that large, um, like warming occurring, which I think keeps that subsurface water quite cold. And then that surface water can get up to about 20 degrees in the summer. So I think maybe some other mid and high latitude shelves where upwelling occurs, they could see similar results with the PCO2. Awesome, excellent. Um, 
I'll just maybe give people a couple more minutes, but it looks like that's it for questions for Kristen. So once again, we would just like to give you a huge thank you for sharing your research with us today. Um, and I'm sure everyone's applauding uh, virtually. You know, it's weird to not have an audience. Um, and yeah, with that, I would just like to thank everyone for coming and thank you once again to Kristen. Um, and once again, for those of you that are um, either here or maybe watching this later, um, you can join our Ocean Acidification Community of Practice at www.oceanacidification.ca slash join dash us. Um, anything else from Allison or Kristen? No, just thank, thank you. you from Neopar. Thank you to you both for being here. Yes, thank you very much. All right. With that, I guess we'll bring this webinar to a close. Um, thank you very much and have a great day, everyone.